There is in the north of England a retreat for church leaders which meets the week before uh, Holy Week each week. And it's very meditative. And one year it was decided that we would each, out of a box, just pick a name from the Easter story. And whichever name you got, for 24 hours you were to immerse yourself in that person and see the story from their perspective um, and, and, and their feelings. And I was really excited if I get a Peter, or even a Judas, somebody that I get my teeth into and, and grapple with. And I put my name in the box and I picked out the women of Jerusalem. <laughs> my heart sank. My heart sank because I wasn't getting any famous person, I wasn't getting any named person, and I had the most amazing 24 hours of my life when I began to hear their story. I began to understand their perspective, but to recognize the scripture writers didn't think them worth enough to name them didn't recognize that they had a story that could help future generations. And I had to rely upon my own imagination, my own creativity. Well, today, I don't. We today are privileged and we are honored to have a real person who is named Reverend Dr. Peggy Cabonte. She comes to us with what I was looking for in that meditation, with that different perspective from a different continent, a different cult culture, a different church, and yet also with a universal understanding. She comes with robust study and, and research. A doctorate is in theology and gender issues. She is a, a member of the Circle of African theology, uh, Women Theology, and yet it is not theoretical, because she comes living it out, working it out, as a Christian disciple, as a minister, as somebody who has worked in her own denomination, but also cross ecumenically and globally. She must be good at it, because she has been... Um, inducted, conducted as the first female clergy person of the United Church of Zambia. That deserves a clap. Yes, as general secretary, yes, sorry. <laughs> but enough clapping, because I have talked enough to her this week in conversation to know that she is also a woman of great faith deep faith, who recognises, and you'll discover as you're here today, her deep trust in God. And therefore she has deep humility. For it is God who has called her, who has provided for her with gifts of the Spirit, and who guides her in her ministry. And I pray that you will hear that as she guides us now in her understanding of discipleship. Welcome. Peggy, to speak to us. Good afternoon. I'm extremely humbled, Kevin, for the kind words that you have used uh, this afternoon, which I do not uh, deserve. But by God's grace, maybe that's why I'm even here. Allow me once again to thank the organizers of this uh, ministers in a gathering. This is a rare opportunity to meet as servants of uh, God, where we humble ourselves at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I was extremely delighted to learn that the organizers had to invite the outsiders to come and speak to us. People that sometimes may not understand us you know, fully, and maybe sometimes we may not even want to listen from what they have to say, but maybe those may be the very things that God you know, wants us you know, to hear 
and it's not very easy sometimes. But I am delighted that I'm part of this uh, minister's gathering and that I was requested and invited uh, to be part uh, of the speakers to just bring in something that uh, we live with, especially in my church as the United uh, Church of Zambia. But allow me to begin by refreshing your uh, memories, especially on the definition of discipleship. I requested that uh, the slides should be, you know, be beamed because I may have a thick pronunciation that maybe some of you may be not uh, uh, getting, you know, the full words that, you know, I'll be, you know, talking about. But when, you know, it is being beamed, you will be following uh, those slides. And may we begin, please. I said I'll begin with the definition uh, of the word um, discipleship. I know it has been um, articulated in many ways, but this is what I would like to bring to you. And the aim is not necessarily to give a deep etymological explanation of disciples, but rather introduce the working definition in this context. The word discipleship is derived from the word disciple, which means a learner. The Gospels and most of the New Testament have a lot of such examples of discipleship as we heard this morning and as we heard from Rowan uh, yesterday. The term applies to one who professes to have learned certain principles from another and maintains them on that other's authority. According to Matthew 4, or chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus is clear and invitation, challenge. Come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men and women. This clear invitation has not changed. Those who responded to this inv invitation to follow, they left their nets at once and followed him. For them, this invitation of Jesus was urgent. They had to let go of what was in order to discover what could be. And again, we were reminded this morning in our Bible study. A few questions and food for thought. What is change? Why is change? Who runs the change? Where is change? Why is there change? Think about those questions. We may come back to, to them later. The church's discipleship challenge. We are living at a time in God's history where every aspect of life is fast paced. The world is also running at the price of a button or swipe. This age of information technology demands that we catch up, whether from the first or third world, it doesn't matter. We really have to catch up. There must be a continual side-by-side -side discipleship dialogue or discussion. And I'm happy that you identified this, and that's why you are gathering in this place. The need to listen to emerging Christian expressions and discovering the questions that they are asking and what form of support would be most helpful in such a discipleship process is a must for the church today. Because we can't keep on burying our heads in the, sun, in the sand when things are happening. I'm talking about the, the new or emerging Christian you know, expressions, especially 
maybe I'm talking from my context because we have had another form of empire which we are calling spiritual empire. And it has come in full swing, forcing some of our members to have a dual membership. The emphasis of church mission field, community-centered. Established and mature leaders must not lose sight of the fact that God is no respecter of persons and is working in every mysterious and not so obvious ways. And this challenges the church to have a discerning spirit. Any effective discipleship should be people-centered, and those who are coming into the faith may just have some of the answers the church had been looking for, for the value of every individual to make a complete whole. People-focused relationship building. <coughs> Encouraging members to critique communities, beliefs, and practices does not necessarily mean breaking the very relationships we want to build. Martin Percy said, if the community is beyond criticism, the infallibility of humans is not taken seriously. This can become damaging and unhealth as we grow discipleship ministries. You know, we should be reaching a point where constructive criticisms are accepted because sometimes we may be doing things in the way we are used to. And many people have said, you know, doing business as usual. But after some time, when people start talking to how we do things, it is incumbent upon the church to give ears to those criticisms and see how best they can recast whatever they have been doing. The church is now tempted to look at its core business in the lenses and influence of corporate thinking with an habit on emphasis, with an emphasis on thought and action. What works is what counts. And there is a quotation there. Because if what we are doing is not working, what other things can we do to make them work? I want to draw an example from my church where I'm coming from. When the United Church of Zambia did not see what was coming, the Catholic Church in Zambia saw it. And so as way back as in 1980s and 90s, for them, when the charismatic movement was coming, they saw it. While my church was closing doors, especially, especially to the young people that were professing this emerging other kind of Christianity, the Catholic Church was opening its doors because they had seen it before us. And so for them, they had to create a space for people that wanted and didn't want to go outside the Catholic you know, church to have this charismatic wing or group in their church. They can worship in whatever manner they want outside the church, but when they come into the mass, then they have to conform. But accommodation was given uh, to them. What am I saying? What works is what counts. We had lost a lot of members we had a lot of splinter uh, groups as a result of, of us depending on this tradition that we have inherited. 
This question is, dealing with how I look at what the world can or would do for me rather than what I would do for the world. The church is there for people and not just for us. That's why I said earlier on, sometimes the answers that you have been you know, looking for may lie in those people that we think they are not inside or those people that have never even gone to a university to study theology or to a Bible, you know, college. This is how God, you know, works. You can't limit him. He works in mysterious ways and he can use anybody whom he, he wants and whom he feels can, you know, deliver. This already is a demonstration of capitalist thinking, individualism, and consumerism tendency that is slowly but surely fueling insatiable greed and feeds into structural and systemic neoliberal economies of the global village where the people on the margins are left out of the goodness and provision of God. How can we enforce or develop discipleship spirit in such a harsh reality? Again, we were reminded the other day and even yesterday how some of the people that have gone before us lived their discipleship. So how can we be relevant even in the midst of such you know, harsh, harsh situations and where you know, the haves have more and the have-nots do not have more or do not have anything, how do we balance up the mission and discipleship of God? Jesus never looked at what the world would give him. Otherwise, he would not dare to come and call us friends, brothers, and sisters. Rather, he came for what he believed he would give out to this lost and weary world, full of broken relationships and hopelessness. Again, we were reminded in our Bible study when Jesus asked the disciples to feed the more than 5,000 crowd after preaching to them. And then the disciples challenged Jesus, where are we going to get the food to feed all these people? And Jesus, in a mysterious way, challenges the disciples. He asked them what they had in their hands. And so they offered. He prayed, multiplied it, and he fed them both the spiritual and the physical uh, food. So many broken uh, relationships in the way that we experience, you know, the people that are on the margins, the people that are vulnerable, how do we create that spirit of bringing them closer, even in a world that sometimes will not allow us, especially with the current economies that we are going through? And yet Jesus is challenging us to go out and not to just remain to ourselves, because this is what it means to disciple other people, both you know, spiritually and physically. For me, the starting point of the early church on discipleship was both practical and spiritual rather than theoretical. And no wonder Peter, with his friends, had to devise a method in which they could be accommodating these widows that grumbled over the distribution of food. 
And he says, instead of the word of God suffering, it's better we appoint other people to be in charge of food distrib- uh, distribution while we do and continue with the preaching of the word. So it was not just, a, you know, a talking, but it was something that they could do and address so that everybody experiences that equity and in the meaning word of equity. In today's uh, pragmatic cultures, discipleship need to be practical too. While there is need to learn Discipleship should start where people are, in communities where they live, work, and our family and friends. And this is, you know, typical of Africanness, the Ubuntu. I am because you are. Without that, then there is no real discipleship. And that's why Musimbi Kanyoro has been talking about the communal theology that especially as Africans needed to devise and work on that instead of the way we have at some point run away from how we used to live and how we used to regard one another. Because previously in my culture, we didn't have orphans on the street or street kids. We didn't have orphanages. We didn't have other you know, homes that we describe. We didn't have street Adults, everybody found home in the family. Everybody was catered for. Whether he was double orphan or half orphan, he found home somewhere. And this is how we were able to look after one another to an extent of when somebody preached the gospel because he lived it, the whole family would be converted. We never used to live as a nuclear family. And I'm not encouraging you that you should be doing that, but this is how we lived. And even when it came to preaching the gospel, it was not difficult because it was not just the gospel of the mind, but also the gospel of the heart. People saw what we meant even when we talked about Jesus coming to give us life and life in fullness. And Jesus as the provider. Jesus as the one who cares. Jesus who heals. Jesus who saves. People could relate what the ministers of the gospel preached to what was happening practically. But nowadays, because some families have departed from that, that's why even on the streets, like in Zambia, where I'm coming from, you can find a few street kids. But we have also been following up with churches and families challenging them. Where have we lost it? Why have we let these children and adults to be on the street? Because previously we lived so well, and this is embedded, you know, in us. It's part of our DNA. Where have we lost it? And so we are also trying to revisit 
or now we can go back to the drawing board and bring some of these things that worked so well and even helped the missionaries that took the gospel to Africa to evangelize many families who later became uh, Christians. So it is in these communities where they live, work, and have family and friends. That's where it works, you know, better. And that's why discipleship becomes easier, especially when you are living it out. There are a lot of churches, even in my country, who have developed well-tailored courses on discipleship with fixed topics organized in a certain order with a goal to achieve effective discipleship and have not achieved all that they desired. Why? Others have adopted a top-down approach where the content and material reflects the top leader's desire, biases, and priorities without <laughs> the communities getting involved. Yes, we can have those, but when people at the grassroots don't own it, they just remain with us and in the books. It is important, therefore, to note that uh, the Holy Spirit does not leave identical fingerprints the same way on each person. The Holy Spirit is not limited to church structures, and as such, he can use individuals to bring renewal to his church. And this is what has happened to my church. Previously, we used to think it's only these ministers that have gone to Bible colleges or theological colleges or to universities that can deliver. But the members at the grassroots have taught us that God does not work like that. And because of that, we have been attentive to hear to what they have to say and to what they, they would want to happen in the church. Although other other people have said, this is the way we have done it. There is no way these young people can divert us from what we have known. But we have told even the, the older people, please be patient. Listen to what these young people have to say. Because you are not only the church. They are also the church. And not that they are the future church. They are the church. And that's why we have been able to attract a huge number of young people in my church. Right now, if you travel to Zambia, three quarters of the membership of my church are young people. Because of some of the deliberate programs that we have put in place to attract them and to make them feel part and parcel of the church that they would want. And because of that, we draw a lot of resources that keep the church alive. In a fast-paced world like ours today, Christians should look at themselves as people of presence, connected to God and to one another through inhabiting unifying power of the Holy Spirit. The church of God is endowed with divine 
impulse that enables it to carry out the mission of God in the great power of the Holy Spirit. The Missio Day. It's not our mission. Us, we are just vessels, or if you like, agents uh, to be used. And to think that we have all the answers, it doesn't work like that. And I've been, you know, I've challenged myself time and again, especially when I'm there to safeguard the policies of the church. When people want to suggest other things, and I'm saying, the Constitution says this and that, so you don't have to say what you are saying. But sometimes I challenge myself and say, please take a minute, take a breath. Maybe what you may be saying and what you may be safeguarding, that's not what God wants. Because, again, somebody said, if, you know, we knew, especially when we pray and when we want something, and we knew well in advance that God would respond in this way and God's answers will come in this way, then he will cease to be God. Because sometimes, you know, we, we, we cannot understand and have, you know, the answer on our fingertips. And that's why maybe it remains God. So I challenge myself, you know, to be, you know, open much as I, I have to safeguard, you know, uh, the doctrine or the dogma or the clauses, you know, in the Constitution and the rules and regulations. Because the Holy Spirit is at work. This is what, you, you know, we are being reminded time and again. In Dr. Luke's account in Acts 20, verse 28, it is recorded, keep watch over yourselves and the whole flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood, his church, not your church, not my church. Which is this church? <laughs> the world's busy and fast-paced lifestyles are to a greater extent distracting the church and posing a challenge to the church's mandate to be the presenters of God's presence in the world. We are all busy. We have all these programs. But how do we apportion time? And how do we give time to the people that God has entrusted us with. I know we all have our lives to, to lead, but having accepted to be in charge of the lives, the souls of people that God created in his own image, we have a huge responsibility because all those look up to us. And how do we match up the time in this busy, paced world. The church should not abandon to cultivate habits and liturgies that create space for creativity and contours for that presence to be felt and you know, known. I was talking to somebody this morning when she came to find out if, you know, when they were singing here, if we can dance. And I was saying, that is part of us. Even in our, in our church, you know, in our worship and, and congregation, you find many people dancing, you know, because we know that we have to celebrate life and we, we have to dance to the, you know, glory of God. Maybe th that's how, you know, we are. It, it is in our culture. I know we have different, you know, you know, cultures. But what I'm saying here is there should be room for 
creativity. And if it was in my church, I would have said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Because those are some of the things that we have, you know, adopted. Although some people were saying, you should have put them in writing and they should be part of the police. I said, there is no way. Then that constitution will be like this. And clapping hands. And clapping hands, of course, but not very, you know, uh, strongly like these others. When there are five people, you, maybe you can think they are like, 1,000 people, but they are just, you know, five people. <laughs> Technology can both be a challenge or an opportunity for the church in its agenda of discipleship. We are experiencing uh, this back in Zambia where uh, the father is on the computer, the mother is on the phone, and the child is by himself. And one child ended up by, you know, going and, you know, slapping the mother. Why are you not paying attention to me? You are always on phone and daddy is on the computer. Like it is put here, it's an opportunity. But also sometimes it can be a challenge, and I'll say more about that, but I'm just uh, being, you know, reminded when we met in, the, in, in Accra in 2004 at the then World Alliance of Reformed Churches. And uh, the church uh, from the West and, and, and South, they were divided because uh, the, the church from the South, they were saying, but this technology, this globalization, what? what? And then the church from the West was saying, if it was not globalization or technology, how else would you have been here in Accra coming from all parts of this world? So we kept on talking and talking and, and challenging you know, each other on just a lighter you know, note. But what I'm saying here is technology can both be a challenge and an opportunity for the church. Technology is pushing the church away from physical and face-to-face -face fellowship gatherings. You know, counseling or pastoral counseling is happening on phone, even, you know, via emails. Even in my church, this is happening, but we had to come to terms with, you know, ourselves and said, yes, we should have room for that. But more importantly, face-to-face -face pastoral care and counseling would help. Because we have a tendency, again, as a church, of losing what our core business is by following what the world is doing. Because this is what the world is encouraging. Why should you be meeting? That's a wastage of money. Why can't you just use, you know? teleconferencing or these other, you know, means of, you know, being together. But honestly, should we be following what the world is suggesting? That's what I'm saying. There are opportunities and challenges. What is it that we can do differently as a church for the world to follow? Because this is what it means to be a disciple, even in a world that is characterized by, you know, people uh, doing their own things and, and busy. How can we make a stop to that and say, please, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want to sit with you. How can the church lead the 21st century people to our wonder and worship of the triune God 
without watering down the message of salvation and quenching the fire of the spirit in an attempt to adapt to the varied contexts. How can the church avoid compromising its identity and godly mandate in the lost world? There is a temptation sometimes that we are part. How can we isolate you know, ourselves? And no wonder maybe Jesus said these words, though I've not included them in my presentation. When many people wanted to follow him because of the miracles, the healing that we had, the saving power, the provision of food, you know, because of those things, many people wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus turns around and says, if you want to follow me, Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. I know it can be challenging, but we are all learning. We are not yet there. This is what Paul reminds even in you know, his sons in faith. We may have learned, we may have gone to this school, that school, but we are not yet there. We are also learners just as we are trying to teach and even to inculcate this Jesus in the lives of, you know, there's so many people so that at least in whatever situation and context they may be, when they are there, they will make a difference. Just as Jesus made a, a huge difference wherever, you know, he was found. Even in the midst of storms, he's lying down. And then the disciples who were with him, they doubt, but they are with Jesus. Sometimes we can be forced to, to doubt and even not to think that Jesus is with us, despite, you know, his absence, but he's always with us. How can the church avoid compromising its identity and godly mandate in the lost world? Thank you. I will take questions. Uh, Peggy kind of apologized for her, her own accent, a distinct accent. We all have distinct accents. I, I, managed, I managed fine, except for one word. And I think I heard the spirit through mishearing. Because when you started, you asked a series of questions. Um, what is the church? What is the church for? Who is in charge of the church? What I heard was, what is change? Yes. What is change for? And who is in charge of change? <laughs> and you spent the rest of your time answering that question. <laughs> We have time for questions, and I hope we have... Jeffrey has his microphone. So no ducking and diving, but... Uh, he thinks he's on the Glasgow rep, doesn't he, you know? Well, we haven't got any questions yet. Oh, we, what, there's, there's one there. You are Dimbleby, sir. Ten, but way where over. We oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Lewis from Bristol. 